to check which of them are here, but uh, it's with Kyle Hayden, Sashka Kuchikova, Siddhi Krishna, Mark Powell, Nathan Sanukian. I feel like at least three of them are in this Zoom room. Um, this is a big group because this was part of uh, a program through AIM. Um, there's this AIM 4D virtual research community that I've been co-organizing with Miriam Kuzberry, who's organizing this, and Hannah Schwartz and uh, Juanita Pinzon Caicedo. Um, so that's been like cool. And, you know, usually when you go to a workshop and you have like a group, nothing happens. But this was like a cool project. So that worked out really well. I'm really excited. Um, ignore the picture. So the theme is that uh, we want to understand exotic surfaces. Uh, and I'll just remind you, I'm trying to keep this pretty expository. I know that we've had like a lot of classes already, but I do think most of you are graduate students. I don't know. Um, but two surfaces for me and a four manifold are an exotic pair if they are topologically isotopic, but they're not smoothly equivalent in the sense that there's no diffeomorphism taking one to the other. Um, and one thing to note here is that when they have boundary, I'm gonna to say topologically isotopic rel boundary. So that's like very restrictive, um, but we're going to obstruct things from being like smoothly equivalent with no mention of boundary. So just diffeomorphism, that's like a weaker, this is like a very strong form of exoticness which I've been told isn't a word. Um, so open question, do there exist exotic orientable surfaces in S4? And this is sort of like the big, for me, motivating question and for our group, what we were supposed to think about. But this is like a little too hard, um, a, a lot too hard. People have thought about this for a very long time um, with basically no existing strategies like that just aren't working yet. Like I have no idea how to approach this problem. Um, one point of interest is that it is important that I said orientable, because in fact, there are non-orientable examples um, by Finnishin, uh, Krek, and Vero. I don't remember when that's from, maybe like the 90s. I don't know. Um, but there's a very good reason that their surfaces are non-orientable. They come from like double branched covers of small exotic CP2s and CP2 bars. Um, but yeah, this is a cool, hard, open problem. And um, well, we have examples of exotic surfaces in other four manifolds. Uh, the first ones came from Fintuchel and Stern using like cyber witten invariants. Um, those methods have been used uh, by other people like um, Hee Jung Kim has, I think, exotic surfaces in CP2. Maybe that's joint with Danny Ruberman, I don't remember. Um, Nathan Sanukian and Neil Hoffman can construct exotic tori in simply connected four manifolds, which are very simple in the sense that the tori are even topologically unknotted, meaning that they bound locally flat solid tori. Um, but S4 is really hard because so far all of our existing smooth obstructions really rely on ambient topology. Um, like the cyber witten invariants just won't ever work to obstruct surfaces in S4. Um, so there's this common theme in low dimensional topology in the last few years that if, if something is too hard in the closed case and you don't wanna to add topology, maybe you could like settle for adding boundary and somehow use boundary as an obstruction. Um, so uh, this happened a year and a half ago. Um, so Ian Zemke, Andres Yuhash and I wrote a paper uh, constructing some exotic orientable surfaces in B4, and so did Kyle Hayden um, in early 2020, uh, which I've combined into one statement. There exist exotic orientable surfaces in B4, but there's actually two flavors of results here. So Kyle showed how to construct pairs of disks, which are exotic pairs, properly embedded in the four ball. And Ian and Andras and I showed how to construct a whole infinite family of pairwise exotic surfaces in the four ball, but they have to be positive genus surfaces. And these approaches, even though the results seem like they can be combined into like one theorem statement, are not very similar. Um, there's a very good reason that Kyle's disks come in finite families. And I I'm gonna talk about those during this talk. So maybe you'll guess why they have to come in finite families. Um, and there's a very good reason that these, uh, these blue surfaces have to be positive genus. So there's like a hole here in the middle um, does there exist an infinite family of pairwise exotic disks in the four ball? And I, I give you permission to think about that instead of the rest of my talk, if you think you can prove that, because I would be very excited, but I don't have a potential family or anything that I think are exotic. Um, like, so this, this, I don't know, come back to that. Um, so new direction, given that we already have like, well, I mean, given that we already have exotic surfaces in the four ball, but we really want to write a paper and write this AIM workshop, like what can you do? Um, so we think like, what about multiple component things? We want it to be interesting. Like you can't just like take split unions or something. So let's try to make multiple component exotic surfaces. 
um, that are like very simple in some prescribed way to exhibit increasingly subtle forms of exotica. And um, subtle is the right word. Um, so we're gonna study things that are called Brunian links, which Sashka refers to as subtle entanglement. Um, so I'll remind you, this might be familiar, uh, that a multi-component link is Brunian if removing any one component yields an unlink. Um, so I said multi-component because like you could argue that a knot, if you remove it, you get the empty set and that must be an unlink, but that's just annoying. Like we don't, we don't do that. Um, so a, a two component link is Brunian, just means that each of the components has to be unknots. So I drew the, the hop link and the whitehead link. Um, those are both Brunian. The Baromian rings, are famously Brunian, you delete one, the other two fall apart. In fact, you might've thought that Baromian meant what I'm telling you Brunian means, but fun fact, Baromian refers to a link where any two component sublink is unlinked. So in, in three components, they're the same, but really any Brunian link is Baromian, but not every Baromian link is Brunian. So that's a fun fact to stick in your back pocket as a pedantic correction in a talk in the future. Um, and then uh, in general, you can construct n component Brunian links for like any big N. So here I drew a, a five component link, but um, you can see that I could, I could add more chains in the middle and like make as many as I wanted. If you've ever made a bracelet out of bubble gum wrappers, that's what's going on here. Okay. Um, so this is, this is links in the three sphere, but I don't care about links in the three sphere. I care about surfaces in the four ball. So for me, a surface link is going to be a disjoint union of connected surfaces, orientable, um, which I, I want each of my surfaces to have one boundary component. So it's like each knot in the boundary corresponds to a surface in the interior um, that should be properly embedded in B4. So I drew a picture of a two component surface link where the boundary has to then be a two component link. Um, okay. Do you have any questions so far? This is like a weird place to stop for questions, but I don't know. Um, a surface, oh, also there's the chat, but I think that's just Sarah. Okay. Um, so a surface link is an unlink if it's isotopic to a ciphered surface for an unlink, um, which I, I was pretty, I, I thought about this for like 10 seconds when I was writing the talk and I was pretty sure that's all I have to say. I think any two ciphered surfaces in components for the in component unlink are isotopic in B4 to this picture where all that matters is the genus of each one. Uh, if you think I should have been more careful with how I said that, feel free to correct me, but I feel like that's fine. Um, but now I have a notion of, of what does it mean for a surface to be unlinked, um, like trivial. So now I can go back to my Brunian definition and make sense of that for surface links. Um, so a multi-component surface link is Brunian uh, if removing any one component yields an unlink. Uh, so it's, it's just like before, except now I don't have like a colorful array of examples because it's, it's significantly harder to draw surface links than it is to draw links. Um, in fact, it's kind of my thing, drawing surfaces. I'd like do this in a lot of papers, but like usually that's like a whole talk, like how to do that. So I don't know, but we will do one example. So here's an example of how you could construct a Brunian surface link and you could bing double a slice disk. So um, I'll remind you, what does it mean to bing double a knot? I say remind, but it's fine if you haven't seen this before. Um, uh, bing doubling is a satellite operation. Um, the pattern is like two unknots sort of clasped together inside of the solid torus we use for satelliting. Um, so if we like here, bing double the figure eight knot, what we get is two unknots that are they're sort of clasped together and as a union like tied into um, a fi figure eight knot, okay? And I've, I've, I've chosen the figure eight so that I don't have to talk about writhe, but like there's like zero writhe. Um, okay, so this is like sort of a natural operation, um, even on like knots and links, uh, comes up all the time in constructing like linking number zero things and burning in things. Um, but it's also pretty natural on surfaces. Uh, Mark says that Friedman does this in like disk embedding theorem. So uh, people have been doing it for a while. Um, here's a funny picture of the Bing double to like maybe keep in mind. Uh, I've just isotoped the, the bing double here of a knot um, to the, get to the right picture where I've, I've taken this like little component, the, the top and bottom of it, and I've sort of dragged them around through the knot. Um, or, yeah, wait, it's this one. 
Okay. Um, so I, I just made my little component look bigger. Um, and I just did this because if you think about surfaces, somehow this one looks more like a surface to me. Uh, and by that, I mean, here's how you bing double a disc. Um, I'm going to start off with a slice disc on the right. So this is like a cartoon of a slice disc called D sitting in B4. Its boundary is a not K. And to get the bing double, uh, I'm going to start with four disjoint copies, parallel copies of D. Um, they don't all have the same orientation, though. I've colored two red and two blue. And then towards their boundaries, I'm going to join together the two red ones and the two blue ones by bands to make connected things. So I'm building two connected components. Uh, and the boundary of this result is the Bing double of K. So I, I call this the Bing double of the disk. And really, this is also a satellite operation of the disk. It's like natural to call this the Bing double, but I haven't attempted to define satellites of disks, and I won't. Um, but it's not super hard to show, uh, just like um, Bing doubling a knot gives us two unknots that happen to be linked together, Bing doubling a disk gives us two undisks, like unknotted disks that happen to be linked together. Um, the way that I could see that either the red or the blue disk on the right is unknotted is to show that they, they co-bound a copy of my original D cross I um, with something in the boundary. Um, so that's a ball. So that's why they're or isotopic to something in the boundary. OK, so this is a Brunian surface. The boundary of any Brunian surface link is a Brunian link. That is correct, because um, if I have a Brunian surface link, and I delete one component, I need to get something that's unlinked, which means its boundary is an unlink. So, so that's why the boundary also needs to be Brunian. Okay, so um, here's a comment. If we bing double one component of a Brunian link, we get another Brunian link. And I've only drawn the like boundary case here, but this works for surfaces too. So I can make Brunian links with more than two components. I can get as many components as I want by just keep on being doubling. Okay. So here's the theorem. Um, we show that there exist orientable in component Brunian surface links for any n at least two. Um, and there's like two different constructions, just like before. Where uh, in red, I wrote that there exist exotic pairs of n component Brunian disk links. And this is modeled off of Kyle Hayden's paper about exotic disks. Uh, and in blue, I wrote there exist infinite families of pairwise exotic Brunian surfaces, but they um, have to have one positive genus component. Um, and this is modeled off of the paper I wrote with Ian and Andras. And again, there's like a hole in the middle here. Where I don't know how to make an infinite family of pairwise exotic and component Brunian disk links, which is not obviously easier or harder than the connected case, I think. Um, so I don't know, certainly related. Um, and I, um, I wrote a lot of the like blue section of the paper, but I'm going to talk about the red section of the paper because it's a half an hour talk and I feel like that comes first. So I'm excited about this. Um, so I'm gonna tell you how to construct uh, Brunian exotic disk links, unless like anybody has a question, like you don't have to type it in the chat. You can interrupt me anytime. So you don't know the implication that if you had like the answer to the first question in the connected case that you would get? Well, yeah, that's a good point. Um, it sort of depends on what your smooth obstruction happens to be, you know, um, without knowing what it is, it's not obvious to me that being doubling wouldn't like destroy it somehow. Um, it does seem likely that if you had an infinite family of exotic disks that you could bing double them and they would stay exotic, but I don't know how easy it would be to prove that that was true. Depends on the invariant. Um, and on the other hand, maybe somehow having two components is like helpful, like you can have one component sort of wrap around the second one and like have some sort of infinite order like operation that you could do um, and, 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 and just solve the two component case separately from the first. Um, I'm just not sure. Okay. Oh, I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, by imposing some more topology, can you construct infinite class of disk, for example, puncture CP2? Oh, um, I think you probably can do it in, a, in another four manifold, but then I would 
my first step would actually be checking if there are um, like some maybe in one of Hee Jung Kim's papers. Like I, I don't know. I I think I think she produces exotic surfaces in CP2 via rim surgery. Um, and uh, they would like that would already be an infinite family. And so uh, I suspect that like that would already exist through other means. Um, but I'm not, I'm not completely sure. I've, um, have you tried using, um, well, so, so Kyle's, Kyle's result uses like a, like the Ockblute cork, right? To construct the discs. Uh, it, it, I guess it uses the cork. I don't know if it's the specific one. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, um, aren't there infinite order corks? Have you tried using like just a similar construction just with like a cork that's infinite? I guess the issue would be like maybe finding the discs for all infinity. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I mean, Kyle's picture, I'm, I'm going to show it in like the next slide. It's, it's drawn in a way where like you can, there's a very obvious disc. Uh, you're not really thinking of it as a cork operation exactly. Okay. Um, so, but maybe, I don't know. Um, okay, so here's how you make exotic uh, Brunian discs. And, and in fact, this is just how you make exotic discs from Kyle's paper. Um, so here is uh, a group of two Kirby diagrams. Um, these are both diagrams for the four ball, if you ignore the not K that I've drawn. Um, because uh, like, so just ignore the not K, this blue two handle here, these are both under crossings, so we can just pull it off of the red and like it will unravel and become a meridian for the red. And that will be a canceling one two handle pair. And the exact same thing on the right, because it's the same link that I've drawn. If, if K weren't in the way, I could pull red under blue and this would become a canceling one two handle pair. So these are two pictures of the four balls, of, of four balls. Um, their boundaries are literally identified because it's the same like Dane surgery presentation on the boundary. Um, so I've drawn the same knot on the left and right, and it's it's really the same knot. This is like the same knot in S3. Um, and I see two different slice discs, one in each picture, which is sort of natural in that picture for K. Uh, here on the left, I have a gray disc, which is, um, it's totally in front of the red dotted circle, and it intersects the blue two handle in two points. Um, and here on the right, I have a gray disc, which is totally behind the red dotted circle, and it intersects the blue two handle in two points. So discs can intersect two handles. That just means they go into the interior of the manifold. So these are really sliced discs. They're in the interior of the four ball. Um, and then uh, Kyle drew this picture of like, what are the two discs? Um, so this is like, if you do all the necessary like slides to trivialize these Kirby diagrams, this is the knot you get. Um, and these are the two different slice discs. So I don't know if this picture is useful, but like psychologically it's like, that's bad. Um, okay, um, so an easy computation shows that the complements of these two slice discs both have cyclic fundamental group, um, which is nice because we need to prove something is topologically isotopic and it's like hard to do that unless like you use some like Friedman style group argument. And so uh, Anthony Conway and Mark Powell proved that if you have two slice disks for a knot whose groups are Z, then they are topologically isotopic rel boundary. So we can just appeal to Anthony and Mark and know that we have topological equivalence, isotopy, rel boundary. Okay, so um, D1 and D2 are not what I wanna think about. They're slice disks for K, they're not Brunian links. Um, but I have this operation that gives me Brunian links. Uh, I'm gonna bing double both of D1 and D2. And um, now I haven't drawn the surfaces anymore because that's kind of like a lot to fit in the picture. But you remember that if you have a disc, you can bing double it and you'll get two discs. So I have a two component link on the left, then a two component link on the right, and I've just drawn the boundary. Okay. Um, so, well, these bing doubles are Brunian. And since D1 and D2 are topologically isotopic, well, boundary, so are there bing doubles. And there's like, there's like a, a curve here of like how much you know about this versus like how much, like the more you know about this, the more I think you should have to think about those things being topologically isotopic. Um, so like you can decide how much you think you need to think about whether or not they're topologically isotopic, but they are. Um, okay, so now we want to distinguish them smoothly. And to do that, we're gonna use another knot that sits in the complement uh, of uh, the bing doubles. Okay, so I've drawn a purple knot on the left and the right, and just like before, the boundaries here are literally identified. So that's literally the same knot 
on the left and the right, but has very different behaviors um, in the left and the right picture. Because on the right side, my knot J is smoothly sliced into the complement of this being double. Um, it bounds this little purple disc. It appears to intersect a two handle. That's fine. That's a slice disc. Um, but that doesn't work on the left hand side. I mean, this this is not really a disc. Discs aren't allowed to intersect dotted circles. Um, that just doesn't mean anything. So I don't know anything about my knot J on the left hand side. Um, and in fact, J is not smoothly sliced on the left hand side. Um, and the way you would prove this is to to make use of some like symplectic topology. Like we're gonna redraw um, our diagram as Legendrian and use the thurston Benekin number to get some sort of like a junction inequality that uh, gives a lower bound on the slice genus for J. Um, so I'm not gonna go into that. There's like um, a long sequence of, of Kirby diagrams in our paper if you want to see that. Um, but that tells us that, um, well, at the very least, my tubing doubles can't be smoothly isotopic rel boundary because if they were, then like, J would have to have the same slice genus on both sides of this picture, um, but it doesn't. Okay, but I defined exotic um, not as the things not being smoothly isotopic real boundary, but not even smoothly equivalent. And so in theory, I should worry that an arbitrary smooth equivalence taking the Bing double of one to the Bing double of two might not preserve J. Um, so then it wouldn't be a contradiction that the slice genus of J isn't preserved. Okay, so I need to show that, well, if I have um, a smooth equivalence, it will induce a homeomorphism on the boundary. I wanna show that that homeomorphism has to preserve J up to isotopy. And that'll tell me my things aren't smoothly equivalent. Um, and so now we use three-dimensional topology. Here's a picture of a JSJ decomposition, which I want to find, sorry. Um, but this is a green torus that like cuts my boundary into two pieces. Um, so this torus sort of goes around my satellite. Um, and one of them just like contains like my satellite piece. That's an exterior Borromean rings if I delete the Bing double. And on the outside, I have the exterior of K. And so I, I drew the not K for you. It was like a big gross picture. Like you can't just look at that and tell things about it. Um, but we can plug that into a program like Snappy and it will tell us that K is a hyperbolic knot. And through some hard three-dimensional topology, um, uniqueness of decompositions, that tells us that any automorphism of this whole picture has to preserve uh, the exterior of K piece. Like it's preserving this whole torus up to isotopy. Um, and Snappy can also compute automorphism groups of hyperbolic things. So it can tell us that this, this K complement has uh, no non-trivial automorphisms up to isotopy. So like it just has to fix J, like that's, that's, that's it. I mean, that's like sort of an unsatisfying answer, but Snappy is like very fast. So that's pretty cool. Um, so this completes the, this, this construction. We have this two component, like, well, two different, two component Bruni links with the same boundary that are an exotic pair. Um, okay, so I have five minutes left, which is not really enough time to tell you about the multiple components, but I'm gonna show you a picture that I think would make you be able to guess how to do more components. Um, I mean, here's like not the actual theorem statement. Theorem, um, if we just keep being doubling these disks, then we'll get exotic pairs of n plus one component disk links where each time I'm, I'm bing doubling the like new smallest component that I've made, just iterated bing doubling. Um, this isn't really the theorem statement because we proved something more general in the paper that applies to the like plots the genus case too. Um, but like, this is like good enough for now. Um, so here's my picture of like, what I mean by iterated bing doubling, we get something on the boundary. We're just like sort of making this like chain of things and we have like a disc bounded by each component. Okay. Um, and so the idea here um, is that again, well, I know these being doubles are Brunian. I know that I started off topologically isotopic. So they're still topologically isotopic. So I just have to obstruct them from being smoothly equivalent and I'll use induction. Um, and we just did the base case. We showed that just like just one fold, just regular being double D1 and D2 gives me things that aren't smoothly equivalent. Um, and so to induct, what we're gonna do is like try to find a relationship between the N fold being double and the N minus one being double to like go back to our inductive hypothesis. Um, so here I, I 
drew in purple, like the smallest components, like the newest ones that I made in this iterated being doubling uh, of my boundary link. Um, and what I'm going to do is say, well, these are both trivial disks. Like my surface is just made of trivial disks. Um, and the nice thing about a trivial disk is you can take a branched cover over it and you still have B4, just like, you know, S3 branched over an unknot is still an unknot, uh, still S3. <laughs> Okay, so here's a picture of the two covers. I'll just zoom in on the cut picture. Um, so I branched over like the smallest disks in the left or right picture. So I get another diagram of B4. It has like a branch set. It covers this branch locus. Um, and I lifted everything in the picture. So all of my disk components at the bottom each lifted disk components, two of them at the top. And the thing to observe here is when I take a cover I get a sublink. I'm sort of drawing it in bold orange. Um, that is again a Bing double, but it has one fewer component. So like this is the n minus one fold Bing double uh, in the cover. Uh, and then here I have the n minus one fold uh, of the other disc in the cover like this. Okay. Um, so, that's great. Now we're ready to obstruct smooth equivalence. The point is that if I have a diffeomorphism that takes the n fold being double of d1 to d2, then, well, it's going to fix, it's going to send that smallest component to the smallest one. This is like another tree manifold argument, which means it's going to lift to a map of those covers. But then if it lifts to a map of the covers, again, using a three manifold argument, it's going to send this n minus one being double to this one. And like my inductive hypothesis is that these things are not supposed to be equivalent. Um, so that would be a contradiction. Um, and I get a, da, 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 a contradiction um, saying that these two things are equivalent. So I conclude that these like big N being double component Brunian links are, um, are exotic. Uh, this is N plus one. Okay. So, um, in conclusion, here are some open problems. These are ones that I said during the talk. Um, one, uh, if somebody did this during the last 20 minutes, like I'd be very happy to hear about that. Um, find an infinite family of pairwise exotic disks in the four ball. Maybe Janet is working on that. Uh, two, find an infinite family of, of pairwise exotic Brunian two component disk links. And like I said before, it's not totally obvious to me if one implies two, and like maybe there's some reason that two would be easier than one anyway, I don't know. Um, and I, I do think that if you could do two, that you could do more. I think probably if you have two and they're Brunian already, I think you could do this covering argument and like, probably like we have some mild assumption about JSJ decompositions, but it's probably like just true. And they probably just our lemma would let you extend that to higher end. Um, and then the, the big guy at the bottom is, can you find an exotic pair of orientable surfaces in, in S4? And I don't have an idea about that. Um, and now it's 1050, which is like perfect. So I'm gonna stop. Uh, let's thank Maggie for an excellent talk. Um, Other questions for the speaker? I saw Al Jahara, uh, Al Jahara asked in the chat. So we don't have hope of using Brunian surfaces to distinguish between Brunian links. Um, that's an interesting question. I would think it was like a really funny result if someone did that. Uh, my immediate response is like, it's harder to understand surfaces than links, but I don't know, maybe not. People like you can compute slice genus. Maybe there's some sort of like weird, I don't have an answer for that, but I would like that. I don't think there's no hope. Um, Brunian links. Are, sorry, what Denza? Sorry, do you want to finish? I would say Brunian links are classified by Miyazawa and someone else, but I forget who the co-author is. Up to um, like some really bad move, so there is some form of classification. Uh, anyway, sorry, what Denza? Yeah, I wanted to ask. Uh, yeah, if you maybe know an example of uh, of uh, exotic uh, pair of discs, which when you bring double, they are not anymore. Oh. Um, no, I, I don't have an example of that. I I kind of think it can't happen, right? Like if you had an example of that, I think that would like already be a paper. That would be like very cool to me. Um, but I don't, I don't know. 
So do you know any example of exotic pair of disc whose complements are actually diffeomorphic? Oh, I think that, well, maybe is Kyle here? I feel like in his paper, the like one of his examples did have diffeomorphic complement. Um, but I don't remember. Um, in, in ours, we very much wanted them to not have diffeomorphic complement. Uh, I didn't talk about this, but we have like a section at the end of our paper where we discuss like different ways you could close off the surfaces to get exotic spheres and other four manifolds. Um, and the abstraction there relies on the disks that I've drawn, not just being exotic, but even having non-diffeomorphic complement. So we, we didn't really think about that other than that. Yeah, just to follow up, um, I don't, I don't know of any examples of exotic disks where you can prove that the complements are diffeomorphic. You just have a pair where you don't know they aren't diffeomorphic, or something. I mean, it, it, I, I can't remember if there's anything specifically articulating that. There's definitely some cases, and there's sort of hints at it in Lisa's lectures, um, where it's not totally clear. Uh, whereas it is clear for, for certain examples, but, um, but right, yeah, on, on the whole, I just, I'm just not quite sure. Uh, but certainly in lots of cases, you can prove that the complements are distinct. Yeah, and I, I didn't talk about the, the other construction using positive genus where the obstruction is floor maps, but I feel like given that the floor maps are different then probably like the sutured floor maps of the complements are different. So the complement shouldn't be diffeomorphic either. But um, I'm really scared that Andras Shuhash might hear that I said that. And like, I don't know if that's exactly right. Like, <laughs> Yeah, I feel in your construction when you do the ream surgery and you're changing the Alexander polynomial, it should change the complement as well, I feel. Your construction is on the same case. Yeah, I think that's right. And 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 what was the reference you said for puncture CP two? Oh, uh, I wasn't for puncture CP two exactly, but I said that I would look at um either He Jun Kim or He Jun Kim with Danny Ruberman. Um, I mean, she's written several papers about exotic surfaces, but she's certainly written something about like surfaces in CP2 with cyclic fundamental group of their complement being ex exotic. Um, and uh, I, I would just check first that like, did she have an infinite family? Could you just puncture those? Okay, let's thank Maggie again for an excellent talk. Thanks. And